Hey class, it's your favourite uh, 57 year old man and um, fraudulent amateur teacher here with um, some parish notes essentially. Uh, I don't have any fixed theme, at least not yet. Perhaps there will be a title above this uh, later which um, will be the theme that is crystallised during the course of a, an extemporization. Um, just as a place to start, I was watching uh, a, a weather documentary about whether we can predict the weather um, and for how long people have been trying to predict the weather. In uh, ancient Greece they had a, on the Acropolis they had a little weather station actually with uh, pictures of the gods and a little kind of weather vane. Um, but actually um, the importance of weather goes back to Homer or in terms of the written record or the oral record. Homer mentioned weather as a very important factor. Obviously shipwrecks and things like that, weather was tremendously important to those and um, um, it just impressed me as an example of uh, the endurance of literary fame that a, a documentary about weather would mention Homer and I would recognize there'd be an image on the screen of Homer, blind Homer with his unruly hair um, and I would say oh yeah that's Homer and this is a guy from what 2,500 years ago if not more, who didn't write anything down, whose stories are remembered simply because he uh, he told them so compellingly impromptu, just like I'm doing now. Perhaps this will be spoken about in 2,500 years. Probably not. Um, perhaps it'll get 300 views on YouTube, though, and that's a kind of posterity, kind of literary fame. Um, what I do in the evenings is that I, I turn on my projector and I watch um, documentaries about usually dead authors and uh, I get particularly excited if there's um, some kind of pan across their bookshelves even if it's a little blurry and I can't really see what kind of books they have because um, I'm, as you know, a collector of 20th century paperbacks, a devotee of old and moulding paper, the smell of it, the touch of it, the design, the layout, the um, the sense of a vanished culture in which people were indulged. Um, as as a kind of contrast, I was also watching a um, a documentary about Ian Hamilton, who was the biographer of Robert Lowell, but also was a very central figure in a certain British literary scene which was involved, um, based in Soho on Greek Street, the, the, the New Review magazine and they went to, uh, into the Pillars of Hercules, the pub next door and uh, drank uh, and it would be people like Ian McEwan, Martin Amos and um, Clive James, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about it, Clive James except that expression, Clive James um, and um, what struck me was that at least half of this documentary, which was made in the 90s, was about football. Or so it seemed to me. Certainly the beginning uh, seemed to establish that he was an all right kind of bloke because he was into sports, Ian Hamilton. That he was... Um, and I haven't read... I haven't even read the Lowell biography. Um, I'm sure it's a very good piece of work. Uh, although he, he then ran into terrible troubles with J.D. Salinger, uh, who um, blocked his book about Salinger, which came out later. Um, in a bowdlerized kind of edition. But um, it just seemed that... And also he had a, a... The New Review, Ian Hamilton, had this kind of character called um, Pig, um, Cecil Pig or something, who was a reviewer. Various people, including um, uh, Julian Barnes and Hamilton himself, took on the mantle of this pig character who then gave vicious reviews to their friends and colleagues, or particularly their enemies. And um, it, it seemed very similar to what Melody Maker was doing with Mr. Abusing, who was this character who had a kind of um, Japanese bandana and um, was extremely rude about many people, including, I think, me on occasion. Um, but also the way that the football invaded the cultural, presumably, uh, ostensibly cultural press in the 90s in all domains that it uh, wasn't just Ian Hamilton and, and all sorts of people 
in the literary world wishing that they were sort of football reporters, but it was also the editor of the NME and Danny Baker and the so-called Danny Empire. I call it the Danny Empire because it's Danny Kelly, who is this enormous, rotund, um, ebullient, uh, but also brittle and hostile, to me anyway, um, editor that IPC put in charge of the NME. Uh, and who really, whose, whose vocation in life was to be a football uh, critic, or a football commentator, rather, and he le- later did become that on cable TV, along with Danny Baker. Um, they've both become very famous, and so I was, um, there's a sort of joke in my uh, Devoto cabaret about how Howard and I now live in Asia because of the Danny Empire. I call it the Danny Empire because there was a headline uh, review of um, both Brian Eno's On Land and Howard Devoto's jerky versions of The Dream, written by Danny Baker, um, which was headlined Fall of the Doman Empire, because they both had domes, they were intellectuals, they thought they had a great echoing space up there, uh, not too echoey because it was full of thoughts that came and went, unlike the heads of Danny, the Dannys and the Danny Empire with their domes, uh, which are just simply full of wise cracks and kind of pub chat, pub quiz fodder. Um, so we've had to split, we've had to leave the country and come to Asia, which presumably is a little bit more cerebrotonic. I mean, apparently, another thing I've been reading recently is how the IQs of Asians are um, allegedly 10 points higher than the IQs of um, Europeans or Americans. Probably considerably more these days, because America seems to be getting stupider by the week. Um, and um, But I was um, watching um, a documentary about Italo Calvino, who is one of my favorite authors, uh, dead authors, there are actually two. The, one of the one of them, the second one, because Ian Hamilton went on to make this TV series called Bookmark in the eighties. So I did vaguely know his face um, as the presenter of Bookmark. But I, by the eighties, I'd stopped watching TV. You have to understand this about me that I, I'm. This is something else I've been planning to blog about. That I'm an, a res, renunciator, an abjurer, a. Um, an ascetic who's always trying to withdraw from things. And, and it's the things which I can't withdraw from that stay with me. Um, I, uh, and my diaries in, in my teens and early 20s are full of accounts of me reading, buying the NME, for instance, for the last time and saying, this is probably the last time I'm going to be buying this paper because it's full of trash and I hate it. And I hate the kind of normative chatter that it uh, sets up in your brain. And uh, it's a bit like the scene in The Man Who Fell to Earth where, where Bowie's got all these TV sets and he's saying, get out of my mind, all of you. Um, I've really, that's been my basic attitude to British culture in particular. Get out of my mind, all of you, because I don't want you. Something else I've been thinking, um, <laughs> endless regressions and digressions, but uh, I've also been thinking about how much of the British genius, the lyrical genius of Britain in pop music or in literature, is Irish, is essentially Irish. Me, I'm Scottish, uh, Gaelic speaking three generations back. Um, one eighth Irish, actually, one, uh, one out of the eight grandparents was born in Ireland. Not enough, unfortunately, for me to get Irish citizenship. I think you need two grandparents for that. But um, I'm very much in accord with this idea that, uh, for instance, David Bowie's mother, Irish, uh, born in Ireland, Morrissey. Elvis Costello, John Lydon, um, even Bloody Oasis. I mean, just about anybody you want to say has any kind of lyrical impact um, turns out to be Irish. And then, uh, or else Jewish. The interesting things that have happened in 20th century publishing in Britain, if you took out Jewish people from that equation, there would be literally nothing left. And this is why Brexit, and yet another reason Brexit is so worrying, if you take out Irishness and Jewishness, there is basically almost no cultural life left in Britain. Even Shakespeare. I mean, I've been dabbling in Shakespeare this week, um, looking at the Comedy of Errors, because I have a copy here of the Comedy of Errors. And um, this is based on a Plotus plot. Plotus, the Roman playwright. Um, so much of Shakespeare comes from um, Italian culture, Greek culture, classical civilization. As now, I suppose, it would a lot would be drawn from American culture, but uh, this is the period I like in British culture is pre-American, um, when people are drawing still on the classical world, the ancient Greek and Roman worlds, and the Comedy of Errors, based on Plotus, uh, a play um, about twins 
who have twin servants and they've been separated and they're trying to discover each other and the errors involved um, are um, you know, one being taken for the other constantly and his servant thinking he's, you know, the two identical twins who have the same, I, I mean, this is, that's already hilarious as far as I'm concerned. Listen to this introduction, um, the comedy of errors plot. When his wife gave birth to twins, both called Antiphilus, well, that's already, to me, that's already hilarious. The idea that somebody would, <laughs> would give birth to twins. Oh, gosh, we've had two children instead of just one. What should we... Better call them something to, to distinguish them. Let's call them both Antiphilus. <laughs> um, Egon of Syracuse brought abort twin boys. Already that's a little bit amusing as well in a, a sort of black way to us because um, the idea of buying... Oh, we've had twins. Let's buy them twin servants. And so they and and the twin servants are also also have the same name. They're they're both called Dromio. So that's already such a far fetched scenario. I mean, you'd think Shakespeare could have come up with something like that himself. But it's a tremendously complex plot, a Chinese puzzle of a plot. Absurd premise, though. Um, so two masters called Antiphilus, two servants called Dromio. Um, who were their slaves. And then there's a shipwreck, and Egon is separated, Ajon, rather, is separated from his wife and from one of his sons and his slaves, and, um, yeah, a comedy of errors, of, a farce, essentially, very complex in that farcical manner. So I was watching it the other night. Um, there's a terrible um, LibriVox recording of the play with all these different and absurdly bad actors, <coughs> or rather amateurs, um, reading the parts of the play. But there's also a, an outdoors production with, with puppets, you know, really crappy outdoors production you can find on YouTube, um, but with very bad sound recording. So what I did was play the LibriVox recording behind the window in which the, um, the bad outdoors production was taking place to make a kind of compound of badness. Um, <clears throat> but actually it lined up quite well. The, the scenes were quite easy to time to each other. And almost word for word, you can almost get lip sync. And this is uh, something else I was going to talk to you about, is post-production um, techniques. For instance, the way I, I add digital tracking shots and zooms and uh, things with uh, the iMovie software I use to make these these um, uh, uh, pods, uh, casts. And uh, post-production is... Um, it's funny because it's uh, skeuomorphic in a sense because you're em I'm emulating the idea that... that as I move, to move around here, uh, the camera, there is a cameraman, a robot cameraman, or even just a, a software cameraman. Actually, I'm just moving around within the frame, obviously, that this is it's a fixed frame. Um, but the idea is that I make this look like a more professional TV production by putting those in, in post-production. Um, which is interesting. Um, somebody emailed me saying they were doing a TV production course at university and they found this style very interesting because it's kind of un unnatural. Sometimes it, I'll pan, uh, I'll have the split frame thing where it's sort of pan so that I'm uh, gradually just a corner of me is in the frame and then there's something incongruous happening. I'm using chance operations essentially a lot of the time, just putting something random but, but quite suggestive in the other frame. And that's kind of, I think it's called associative creativity by some people, the idea that you're connecting things which are, were not normally connected. You might have one lexical set, one, one group of things which all people would always make well-known connections between, and then you have another which is totally unrelated. Then if you throw a great line across between those two blobs, you get some very interesting juxtapositions and uh, collage, essentially. So a lot of what I do culturally, whether I'm doing an art show or a record, is this kind of collage where I take one thing, you know, analog baroque, take analog computers and electronics, and already outdated and nostalgic form of electronics when I was dealing with analog baroque in the late 90s. And then if you put um, Shakespearean songs or something into that style, um, you get... Uh, Actually, I heard a great Leo Chadburn, uh, a soundtrack he did for an art piece recently. Um, beautiful version of Dowland, a Dowland song, but with sort of analogy electronics, which might have owed a little bit to what I was doing in the 90s, because I know that Leo Chadburn, then known as Simon Bookish, was um, following me in, in a kind of interested way. But um, a beautiful Dowland is so great. I mean, I don't need any pop music ever again. I just have to listen to Dowland's airs. Find the signal. I think.
think we're close. What are you doing? I'm preparing for battle. was coming. Check out John Dowland. Um, and, um, but what was I going to say? Yes, post-production is a much bigger subject than just how you do your fake tracking shots in iMovie. It's also uh, Nicolas Bourriot, the art theorist from France, um, wrote this book called Post-Production, which if you're very naughty um, and don't believe in copyright, you can probably Google Bourriot post-production PDF and you can find that some very naughty academic has put the whole book online, which I shouldn't tell you about because it's published by Sternberg, who I also have published with, but um, <laughs> in the past. But um, yeah, so post production for Bourriot is a whole uh, way of working which involves so many of today's contemporary artists because it's about the idea that there's a pre existing cultural stock of raw material, which is not really raw material, it's already worked artworks which are presumably copyright as well, so it's got a whole copyright implication, but that uh, artists, art according to Bolio is an editing table for reality, and um, so it's a place where you chop things up, already existing artworks, and splice them together with other things. So the, uh, the creativity, the originality, it consists in precisely that splicing or collaging of things, that association between one thing and the other, which uh, normally is not made those things would normally not be edited together. And presumably the um, you make an editing table, you have, re you have reality, you have the newspapers, you have uh, your cup of coffee sitting there on that table. I think of it as a light box, a photographic light box. So you've got things with light shining through them. Some of them let the light through, others don't. And you can, you can sort of somehow hook them up to each other and make an artwork. Post-production by Borgio. I think it's good. He also came up with this um, term of relational aesthetics in the 90s and so some of the artists he's describing as post-production artists like Liam Gillick he would also be describing as relational aesthetics artists uh, so it's not mutually exclusive or um, an entirely umbrella category but yeah I was going to talk about that because I, I do see a lot of what I do as post-production work in that wider sense post-production as a, a, an artistic strategy um, but to go back to Calvino where we started um, there's a fantastic documentary, uh, and it's the contrast to Ian Hamilton again. Fantastic documentary shot in Paris, where Calvino had an apartment in the 70s. So it's from just when they're actually demolishing Les Halles, Les Halles uh, fruit and veg market, as it was, is a huge hole in the ground. Les Halles, the hole, which now has actually it became a shopping centre, which was kind of a shithole. Now it's been refurbished and is still a shithole, but slightly less so. But as Calvino says in this documentary, it would have been wonderful if they'd, uh, if they'd somehow allowed the old market to survive. Um, but uh, he's, he's very much in favour of Paris as a kind of museum city, as a kind of living museum. Uh, for instance, if you just go out for a cheese, every cheese shop is a kind of museum of cheese. They have every type of cheese there. Um, they're really into cheese, they're really into the artisanal production of cheese. and uh, So he sees it as a, a living encyclopedia. And also he loves the metro, because it's a kind of weird Piranesian subculture, an underground um, city in a sense, an invisible city under the real city. And, uh, and, and it gives also the liberty of the city, gives it a sense of uh, um, freedom. He says that in Paris it's a bit like being in the countryside. Uh, he has a, an isolated um, villa in the Italian countryside, but he finds isolation in Paris. Every morning he goes to buy the Italian newspapers, but Saint-Germain-de-Prés, 
and he takes the metro there and back. It, uh, voyages these days are not anymore this uh, question of going from one stage to another, one town to another, but uh, rather of going above the clouds or under the ground. He's always had confidence in the metro. First of all, when he was young, he arrived in Paris, and uh, the metro gave him the impression of having the keys to the city. He could go anywhere on the metro. But also he likes the... Uh, it reminds him of the un underground world of Jules Verne, which fascinated him, the journey to the center of the earth. He also likes the anonymity. You feel as if you're at the same time in the middle of the crowd, but also you have, you're not owned by the crowd, you don't belong to it. So you have a sense of being invisible. The other evening in the metro uh, appeared a man with bare feet, without stocks and shoes. He wasn't a, a hippie or a gypsy or a tramp. He was a man like you and me. A colloquial, um, perhaps a bit prof professorial. He had gone on the train with no shoes and socks. Um, just making as if he was at home, been making himself comfortable, and nobody paid any attention to him. So he had this sense of being invisible, perhaps, and uh, it's a, a dream that we all have in a city like Paris of being invisible. But but anyway, um, yeah. So there there are these two Calvino documentaries. The second one is by Ian Hamilton, and it's in the last year of Calvino's life, which is 1985. They're um, talking about Mr. Palomar, his last novel, which is a very elegiac and um, gentle and short novel about a man who simply wants to read the environment like a book. And actually, ironically, this is what um, Calvino was doing in that earlier documentary, which is in, in Italian. An Italian crew comes to interview him in Paris in, I think, 1974. And he says again that he, he thinks the city is legible. And he goes also to La Défense and talks about Jacques Tati and playtime and... Uh, how there's this um, strange artificial um, city being created on the outskirts of Paris. But um, his, um, I don't know, it just seems <clears throat> it's very exemplary to me as a, as, as a picture of an author. After a seven days march through woodland, the traveler directed towards Borsis cannot see the city, and yet he has arrived. The slender stilts that rise from the ground at a great distance from one another and are lost above the clouds support the city. You climb them with ladders. On the ground, the inhabitants rarely show themselves. Having already everything they need up there, they prefer not to come down. Nothing of the city touches the earth except those long flamingo legs on which it rests. And when the days are sunny, a pierced angular shadow that falls on the foliage. Tre ipotesi si danno sugli abitanti di Bauci, che odino la terra, che la rispettino al punto di evitare ogni contatto, che la amino come era prima di loro e con cannocchiali e telescopi puntati in giù non si stanchino di passarla in rassegna, foglia a foglia, sasso a sasso. Formica per formica, contemplando affascinati la propria assenza. Uh, he's sitting there in, a, in a, a butterfly chair with his books behind him, and they have this kind of the white, I have this fetish about white, the glow of white paperbacks, and that sort of literary fiction, which has really never existed in Britain. Um, there isn't really, there are lots of people, you know, serious writers writing about football, for instance, but there aren't these super literary 
publishers like L'Edition de Minuit uh, making literature about literature. I mean, there, ha there are, uh, again, it's not the English, it's people, Scottish publishers like John Calder who've been putting that out. John Calder, who is still alive, but who's very much the last of a vanishing breed. Pete Ayrton also um, perhaps has done it at a certain point. Um, Simon Pettifer, who started Black Spring Press, which put out my lyrics collection, was attempting to do it, but they essentially had to work with bigger publishers and go freelance. And um, Most people can't sustain that kind of... Uh, literary imprint and, and the French because the French um, because my, my sort of cliche idea of the typical French literary author is like a, a Japanese woman who's signed to a French publisher who publishes rather waif-like and uh, um, melancholy uh, meta texts uh, and um, so it's, it's playing to both the orientalism of the French and to their aestheticism and because, because the French, in a sense, have annexed those, those particular qualities, um, the British, or the English anyway, can't. They have to say, no, 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 we're, we're into sports and we're into directness of speech, or we're into politics. I mean, so many of the book papers in Anglo-Saxon countries are essentially just slightly more intelligent political papers that go on at greater length about Brexit or whatever. You know, the New York Review of Books, even the London Review of Books, which I like a lot, um, it's just a well-written political commentary, essentially opinion pieces by clever writers, you know, who, who do have publishing careers. But there isn't really this sense of literature as a, or as a vital, ongoing, the spikiness of looking and seeing and feeling. And um, I don't know, Calvino, for me, is one of my fetish authors because he does represent someone who's simply um, very much caught up, without being difficult or obscure, um, caught up in this um, question of just treating the world as something legible. Anyway, I, I think I've spoken long enough and rambled, and I don't know if I've associated enough to those topics. They're just things I've been wanting to talk about, and I thought I'd do it today, you know. Since I'm an amateur, it doesn't matter. You can't ask for your money back, because you didn't pay any money, did you? Open University.